Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here one more time, String Tech Workstations, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. We are doing a necker set on this beautiful Koa Dreadnought for Paul, it's 1980. And I thought I would bring you in at this point to kind of show you what I've got. I have gone through all of the geometry to get everything right and everything lined up. And I am gluing the shims in. And I thought I would show you this as I take it apart. Sometimes it's better to explain it as you see me disassemble. I have press fit that male dovetail into the female dovetail in the block with the appropriate shims, which are a little too thick. And that's what you want. I'm going to work them down to the right size for a perfect fit. All right, so we'll take a minute here and explain this relief cut that I made on the top of the dovetail. I'm giving you this view so that you can see the square tubing that runs underneath the fingerboard and this is a neck reinforcement. It's sort of like a truss rod, it's just not adjustable. So by making this cut and the deepening of the 14th and 15th fret slots, that gives us this flexibility for the fingerboard extension to flex down tight to the soundboard. This is the stealth approach where there's no wedge put on here. The original rosewood is glued to the original Koa, in this case Koa soundboard. And once it's all done, well you'll have a good look. We will have restored all of the structural integrity. The other thing I'll do before the neck is glued on is I will fill those holes that we use for the steamer. I'll fill those up with rosewood dust. We'll make this job completely undetectable when it's done. Now we're ready to fill those holes with rosewood dust. So I'm gathering up some rosewood dust to fill those holes up. The other thing that I've mentioned in other videos, and I've done it here again, is the 3rd fret and the 11th fret are my pilot frets. So when I slip that straight edge up to the bridge, what that tells us is there'll be lots of room. And the action at the saddle when Paul dropped the guitar off was basically too high to play. And even if you had the brute force to play with action that high, it doesn't do you any good because the guitar would never be in tune. So now when I slip that straight edge up and I hop up onto that saddle, we have a very good action level. And the new saddle will probably end up being slightly higher than this. I deepen these two fret slots that allow the fingerboard extension to flex down tight to the top. I do not put a wedge under there. I try to take more of a stealth approach. I have a piece of rubber up against the head brace on the inside and this rubber on the fingerboard to pull this fingerboard extension down tight. But when I'm done and you look at this repair, we've covered our tracks. Just no one would ever know that the neck was off this guitar. But by setting the neck back and then making the correction on the trajectory of the fingerboard surface to the bridge, by sanding from the second last fret here right up to about the fifth fret, then we change that trajectory without putting any extra load on the soundboard when it's all done. Let's have a closer look at this. So I started this process after getting the neck set correct. Of course the fingerboard extension drops off and you end up getting a high spot at the 14th fret where the neck meets the body. I started with a small scrub block. Now this 11th fret, I've taken that out and put it back in a few times over the course of verifying the proper angle. So I started with a scrub block, I took out the highest spot, and then with a slightly larger one, I chased it back a little further. And then this was the longest block I used in this case. And you can see on the fingerboard where the 
sanding marks stop, which is around the fifth fret. That's the third fret. That one stayed in the, through this whole process. Because you have to remember that this is a non-adjustable neck. It has a square tubing inside to support the neck. You're not able to adjust it. So at the Martin factory, they had already achieved a beautiful relief in this neck. And that's why from the nut to about the fifth fret, I left it alone. It was from the sixth fret right up to this second last fret here that I did all of that work to change that trajectory. Now we're ready to put these frets in because I like to put the frets in on the fingerboard extension before the neck is glued on so that the body and the top of the guitar never takes a hit with a hammer blow to drive those frets in. So that's my next step. So these are the two holes that we just covered up. That last little bit will be done after the whole fret job is finished. I've got three hot cloths in that hot cup of water and three dry cloths and six scoop up sticks. So this is the setup for the clamping configuration. I have a curved call and that quick grip clamp with the soft rubber pads pulls that call down tight and that in turn pulls the fingerboard extension tight to the soundboard. Now I do keep my eyes on this for a few minutes because you will end up getting a little bit of extra squeeze. We've got a beautiful fit on this. 100% contact all the way around. Dovetail's good and tight. Neck angle is perfect. But it's still, like I said, want to keep a real close eye on that there. I can see that starting to seep out already. So we'll give it about three or four minutes to keep my scoop up sticks handy as we go. So the tongue depressor is like a soft wooden knife. Well, in this case, it's much softer than the koa, which is the soundboard on this guitar. Allows you to get in right tight to that intersection and scoop up any hint of glue squeeze. Oh, here is one of the trickiest parts of this whole job. When I stick that feeler gauge on there, we have the perfect amount of relief from the first fret to the eighth fret. Try that in the middle of the neck. Yep, and the outside exactly what we were after. So we utilized that original relief that Martin had put in when this guitar was made. It was from the second last fret up to about the sixth where I did most of the sanding I need to control that trajectory to get the lay of the neck as it is now. So these are EJ19 bluegrass strings. 12 on the top, 56 on the bottom. The perfect match for this guitar. It sounds and plays awesome. Here's a good view of the fingerboard extension to the soundboard joint and the cheeks of the heel as they meet the sides. So by deepening the cut at the 14th and 15th fret, it allowed this fingerboard extension to lie down beautifully. And we're back to covering our tracks again. So at a glance, nobody would ever know the neck was ever off this guitar. Okay, on to the K&K system. This is the ingenious installation package they give you. Very simple, but very effective. So the idea is this is like a little stethoscope that attaches to the underside of the bridge plate. You use this peg to line it up dead center with the first string. So it is only the first string 
where you line it up dead center. C. The other strings, you split it between the middle two strings, D and G, and then the bass strings, A and E. After years of research, they've come up with this formula. One of those details that you want to be aware of, instead of placing this between the first two strings, it's centered dead center on the first string. Essentially what we're doing is we're putting this directly underneath the saddle. You want to make sure that you don't push back too far because if you think about it, the ball end of the string goes in there and then folds over. You want to make sure that that ball end does not touch the actual pickup. If anything, you're better off erring on the side of caution and maybe bringing it forward a little bit. So we use a thicker paste type of super glue. The indexing pins hold it in place. I gently push it up to the bridge plate hold it for about a count of 60, and then release. Now the middle transducer is placed directly under the saddle in between the two middle strings, G and D. Again, word of caution, you're better off being a little too far forward just to ensure that those ball ends of the strings don't nip into your little stethoscope. We are getting ready to install the input jack. So I tend to use just like a quarter inch dowel, reach in through the tail block and index that dowel into the input jack, quarter inch jack, and then gently bring it back. And by the way, this isn't a paid advertisement. I'm just, I just installed the last seven out of 10 systems. I've done have been K and K, so, so I thought it'd be a good idea to just kind of walk you through this system that is becoming increasingly more popular. Okay, now we have just the right amount of thread protruding. Put that washer on first. And now we put our little trim cuff on. And grab that with a chunk of leather. And snug that down tight. That'll do. Always a good idea to jam a little paraffin wax into those threads. Now that Paul has this strap button to use for his strap, he'll never have to worry about that input jack loosening up because it will never be used for his strap. I did want to point out that I actually sand a little bit of a radius onto this foot of the button so that it fits snugly on that curved surface. That's sitting good and flush. So you have to make sure that you keep in mind that there is a curvature this way, a curvature this way, and that you want to make sure you get just the right angle so that the foot of that strap button plants firmly against the heel. And that will not rotate. So that just goes a long way to get it to sort of seat nice and flush with the curved surface of the heel. And this is for the 12 to 56 strings. I did install some solid ebony bridge pins with the pearl dot little brass ring, just to dress it up a little bit. There are so many different nuances of tone. This Koa Dreadnought. acoustic guitar.
So this is the K and K system plugged straight into the Lab Series. You know, it's no wonder these K and K systems have become so popular. It's so close to the natural sound of the guitar. This is probably the simplest calibration test you can do for your guitar. That, that garden variety C chord form at the 8th fret, making it a G. Same form. Listen to the overtones on this thing. Now a D. And then C. This is an A minor 9 to C sharp minor 7 over G sharp to G6 to B minor 7 over F sharp to F major 7 sharp 11 to E back to A minor to E7 sharp 9 and just let that play. Resurrected. Here's our final shot. This whole job. There's the ebony bridge pins with the with mother of pearl dots. The cantilever compensated bone saddle for these 12 to 56 strings at concert pitch.
our new frets, our reset neck, and the cantilevered compensated nut. These are the Spurzel machine heads that I took apart and lubricated and put back together. It's not just that the guitar plays fantastic, sounds fantastic, but it's super stable now that it's been calibrated. And with those Spurzel tuners, Paul will very rarely even reach to tune this guitar.